And our presenter, Michael Hauser, has brought a lot to show us this evening. As you can see around the room, um, there's many items to look at, as well as obviously Michael will take us on a trip through history of the Hudson store. Um, Mr. Hauser was a sales associate for over a decade at Hudson Southland store, worked many of Hudson's downtown warehouse sales, and was previously employed at two large department stores in Grand Rip Rapids. Excuse me. He is currently the marketing manager for the Michigan Opera Theater and the Detroit Opera House, and is the co-opera excuse me, co-author of five books for Arcadia Publishing, including Hudson's, Detroit's legendary department store. Additionally, Mr. Hauser was guest curator at the Detroit Historical Museum for the Remembering Downtown Hudson's exhibit. And here to share his insights with us tonight, please welcome Michael Hauser. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out tonight, and happy holidays. I can't think of a better evening to share our memories of the company on this cold, blustery evening, even with snow. <laughs> um, just a quick raise of hands. How many of you worked for the company? Okay, great, great. Um, before the end of the evening, we're going to take a little bit of time to take Q&A and also share memories as well. Now, the company began in 1881 at the original Detroit Opera House on Campus Marshes. It started out as a men's and boys store. Was at the Opera House for several years, became very successful, moved across Campus Marshes to Michigan and Woodward, probably where some of you remember where one of Sanders' original stores was. It's only there for a couple of years, and then in 1891, moved to Gratiot and Farmer, and the company built what was called the Big Red Store. And this was an eight-story building uh, at Farmer and Gratiot, one of the largest retail buildings in town at the time. Now, a number of retailers felt that Mr. Hudson was a little crazy for wanting to move east of Woodward. But of course, he had plans. And that store was very successful. He wanted to be on that 1200 block of Woodward that we all grew up with between Gratiot and Grand River. However, at that time, that block was occupied by a Presbyterian church, Himmelhoe Brothers and Company, and also Newcomb Endicott and Company. A lot of people have forgotten about Newcomb's. Newcomb's was Michigan's first department store. Um, they actually were in the same space at the Opera House where Hudson started. Once Newcomb's vacated the Opera House, that's when Hudson's moved in there. Newcomb's then moved to Grand River and in Woodward. Initially a five-story building and then later on erecting a 12-story building next to that. They were a few notches above Hudson's. Hudson's was always a little envious of Newcomb's. However, starting in 1910, Hudson started buying slivers of property on that 1200 block so that by the late teens there was enough square footage in buildings that they had erected on that 1200 block that they decided that the 1891 building needed to go. So in 1923 they erected a 16-story addition where that big red store once stood. And then, by 1927, bought out Newcomb's, demolished their buildings, and in 1928 opened up pretty much what we all knew as what we call the Tower Edition, which by then encompassed not quite the entire block. There was one holdout, and that was Salon Jewelers at the Gratiot end, which they acquired that piece of property in 1946 and then put in a 12-story addition, and also expanded the mezzanine that year. And then later that year also added five more floors at the Grand River end. So by the end of 1946, you had about 2.1 million square feet in this building. Tallest department store ever built anywhere. And 17 floors of merchandise and services for the public, more than any other store. Now, the downtown store was just a tad smaller than Macy's Herald Square, which is still the world's largest department store 
topping out at about 2.2 million square feet. Hudson's was 25 floors above ground, four floors below. Macy's Herald Square is 21 floors, but not merchandised on all of those floors. So unfortunately, Mr. Hudson never got to see the fruits of all of his labor because he passed in 1912. He died of pneumonia. He was on a trip to Great Britain, which is where he was originally from. But he had been grooming his nephews, the Weber brothers, to really you know, turn the business into what it became. And so they are the ones that really propelled the company into what it became. Now, the company was a little late in going to the suburbs. They were very, very proud of the downtown building. Their contemporaries, though, like Marshall Fields, and Macy's, and Bloomingdale's, of course, had opened suburban stores as early as the 1920s. Um, Hudson's first branch store, of course, was Northland, opening in 1954, although Eastland was actually supposed to open first. However, at that time, what was then Gratiot Township was not all that eager for development, and there also still happened to be a farm on that property. <laughs> so Southfield Township was very eager for development and greenlighted the project almost immediately. So Northland opened in 1954, Eastland in 1957. And of course, we all know what happened after that. Westland, Oakland, Pontiac, Twelve Oaks, Lakeside, Fairlane, Briarwood, until there were 23 stores throughout Michigan, plus South Bend, Fort Wayne, and Toledo. I brought a number of things tonight, too. Hopefully, you'll take a chance to, uh, to look at some of these things. Um, on this table here, this is pretty much devoted to dining. Dining was very important, not only to the downtown store, but also to all of the branch stores as well. This is a lot of silverware and pewterware from the dining rooms on the 13th floor. There's also some uniforms. I found a number of items in the building uh, back in 1996 and 97, before it came down. Um, Mayor Archer at the time had created the Greater Downtown Partnership. Uh, to figure out what to do with the block. Because, um, you know, the store closed, downtown store closed in January of 1983. Um, the last departments left the building in 1986. Uh, the building was sold in 1990. Now, the folks who bought the building in 1990, Southwestern Associates in Windsor, of course, had grand plans to turn it into a mixed use facility. Of course, that never happened because almost immediately they started to strip the building. And this went on for quite some time and then they cut the fire suppression system and wouldn't let the fire department to have access to the building. Meanwhile, the fourth basement had flooded. Um, fires in the building, people breaking in, they just weren't good stewards of the property. So. Mayor Archer created the Greater Downtown Partnership to sort of go behind the scenes and buy various people out. Because after the Windsor people left the building, they in turn sold the building to a Gross Point developer who also brought in a partner from Oak Park, an architect. And then a Detroit-based church also bought a portion of the property. So you had three people claiming ownership of the property nobody paying taxes, nobody paying for security, things disappearing. A Wyandotte alarm almost got the building in foreclosure for $35,000. So if you could imagine that. A friend of mine was working at the partnership at the time and I said, you know, the building has not been documented photographically in many, many years. We really need to do this uh, because the mayor and big business really wanted the building gone because they felt that there just wasn't enough money to renovate it and if all their resources went into one building there wouldn't be enough to take care of the rest of Woodward Avenue because once the store closed there was literally no foot traffic for the rest of the retailers and it was like the domino effect up 
and down Woodward after downtown. I'm the marketing manager for the Michigan Opera Theater and the Detroit Opera House and is the co-opera, excuse me, co-author of five books for Arcadia Publishing, including Hudson's, Detroit's legendary department store. Additionally, Mr. Hauser was guest curator at the Detroit Historical Museum for the Remembering Downtown Hudson's exhibit. And here to share his insights with us tonight, please welcome Michael Hauser. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for coming out tonight. And happy holidays. I can't think of a better evening to share our memories of the company on this cold, blustery evening, even with snow. <laughs> um, just a quick raise of hands. How many of you worked for the company? OK, great, great. Um, before the end of the evening, we're going to take a little bit of time to take Q&A and also share memories as well. Now, the company began in 1881 at the original Detroit Opera House on Campus Marshes. It started out as a men's and boys store. Was at the Opera House for several years, became very successful, moved across Campus Marshes to Michigan and Woodward, probably where some of you remember where one of Sanders' original stores was. It's only there for a couple of years, and then in 1891, moved to Gratiot and Farmer, and the company built what was called the Big Red Store. And this was an eight-story building uh, at Farmer and Gratiot, one of the largest retail buildings in town at the time. Now, a number of retailers felt that Mr. Hudson was a little crazy for wanting to move east of Woodward. But of course, he had plans. And that store was very successful. He wanted to be on that 1200 block of Woodward that we all grew up with between Gratiot and Grand River. However, at that time, that block was occupied by a Presbyterian church, Himmelhoe Brothers and Company, and also Newcomb Endicott and Company. A lot of people have forgotten about Newcomb's. Newcomb's was Michigan's first department store. Um, they actually were in the same space at the Opera House where Hudson started. Once Newcomb's vacated the Opera House, that's when Hudson's moved in there. Newcomb's then moved to Grand River and in Woodward, initially a five-story building and then later on erecting a 12-story building next to that. They were a few notches above Hudson's. Hudson's was always a little envious of Newcomb's. However, starting in 1910, Hudson started buying slivers of property on that 1200 block so that by the late teens, there was enough square footage in buildings that they had erected on that 1200 block that they decided that the 1891 building needed to go. So in 1923, they erected a 16-story addition where that big red store once stood. And then by 1927, bought out Newcomb's, demolished their buildings, and in 1928 opened up pretty much what we all knew as what we call the tower addition, which by then encompassed not quite the entire block. There was one holdout, and that was Salon Jewelers at the Gratiot end, which they acquired that piece of property in 1946 and then put in a 12-story addition and also expanded the mezzanine that year. And then later that year also added five more floors at the Grand River end. So by the end of 1946, you had about 2.1 million square feet in this building. Tallest department store ever built anywhere. And 17 floors of merchandise and services for the public, more than any other store. Now, the downtown store was just a tad smaller than Macy's Herald Square, which is still the world's largest department store topping out at about 2.2 million square feet. Hudson's was 25 floors above ground, four floors below. Macy's Herald Square is 21 floors, but not merchandised on all of those floors. So unfortunately, Mr. Hudson never got to see the fruits of all of his labor because he passed in 1912. 
he died of pneumonia. He was on a trip to Great Britain, which is where he was originally from. But he had been grooming his nephews, the Weber brothers, to really you know, turn the business into what it became. And so they are the ones that really propelled the company into what it became. Now, the company was a little late in going to the suburbs. They were very, very proud of the downtown building. Their contemporaries, though, like Marshall Fields, and Macy's, and Bloomingdale's, of course, had opened suburban stores as early as the 1920s. Um, Hudson's first branch store, of course, was Northland, opening in 1954, although Eastland was actually supposed to open first. However, at that time, what was then Gratiot Township was not all that eager for development, and there also still happened to be a farm on that property. <laughs> so Southfield Township was very eager for development and greenlighted the project almost immediately. So Northland opened in 1954, Eastland in 1957. And of course, we all know what happened after that. Westland, Oakland, Pontiac, Twelve Oaks, Lakeside, Fairlane, Briarwood, until there were 23 stores throughout Michigan, plus South Bend, Fort Wayne, and Toledo. I brought a number of things tonight, too. Hopefully, you'll take a chance to, uh, to look at some of these things. Um, on this table here, this is pretty much devoted to dining. Dining was very important, not only to the downtown store, but also to all of the branch stores as well. This is a lot of silverware and pewterware from the dining rooms on the 13th floor. There's also some uniforms. I found a number of items in the building uh, back in 1996 and 97, before it came down. Um, Mayor Archer at the time had created the Greater Downtown Partnership uh, to figure out what to do with the block because um, you know, the store closed, downtown store closed in January of 1983. Um, the last departments left the building in 1986. Uh, the building was sold in 1990. Now the folks who bought the building in 1990, Southwestern Associates in Windsor, of course, had grand plans to turn it into a mixed-use facility. Of course, that never happened because almost immediately they started to strip the building. And this went on for quite some time, and then they cut the fire suppression system and wouldn't let the fire department to have access to the building. Meanwhile, the fourth basement had flooded. Um, fires in the building, people breaking in. They just weren't good stewards of the property. So Mayor Archer created the Greater Downtown Partnership to sort of go behind the scenes and buy various people out. Because after the Windsor people left the building, they in turn sold the building to a Gross Point developer who also brought in a partner from Oak Park, an architect. And then a Detroit-based church also bought a portion of the property. So you had three people claiming ownership of the property, nobody paying taxes, nobody paying for security, things disappearing. A Wyandotte Alarm almost got the building in foreclosure for $35,000. So if you could imagine that. A friend of mine was working at the partnership at the time, and I said, you know, the building has not been documented photographically in many, many years. We really need to do this uh, because the mayor and big business really wanted the building gone because they felt that there just wasn't enough money to renovate it, and if all their resources went into one building, there wouldn't be enough to take care of the rest of Woodward Avenue because once the store closed, there was literally no foot traffic for the rest of the retailers. And it was like the domino effect up and down Woodward after downtown Hudson's closed. Kresge's left, Woolworth's left, the shoe stores, um, the jewelry stores, the clothing stores. So there, there just was not enough traffic to sustain enough business for the rest of the retailers. So we got permission from the Greater Downtown Partnership. I pulled half a dozen volunteers from Wayne State University, got the keys to the building, would go in on Friday, Friday afternoons, on a, a week, every weekend for almost a year. We had keys to the loading dock door, and then we just focused every floor, all 32 levels of the building, which included the mezzanines and the half floors. 
and photographed, I think we took about 3,000 images, black and white color slides at the time. Didn't have digital cameras at that time. Cameras would freeze up in <laughs> the lower depths of the building. Uh, and we turned those over to not only the Detroit Historical Museum, but also to the National Building Museum at the Smithsonian. And then we also pulled enough artifacts out of the building for a 5,000 square foot exhibit at the Detroit Historical Museum. So, and it was so funny too because the board and the trustees at the museum green-lighted the project, but they also wanted to see the building. And so they decided they wanted to come down Thanksgiving week. Well, we had had a snowstorm that week, and there were a lot of drifts on Farmer Street. And this loading dock door, we could only open a few feet off of the ground, and then we crawled under it. Well, if you can imagine the board and the trustees <laughs> crawling under that, by the time we got to the seventh floor, they'd seen enough. So, so it was literally like a 21st century archaeological dig because no electricity in the building, all of those floors. Whenever we found items, we would have to bring everything down. Remember, no, no electricity. So hoofing up and down the stairs. So whether it was etched windows, uh, all different types of architectural artifacts, we would bring everything down to the main floor, fill the van, we'd have to take it that day because we knew when we came back, it wouldn't be there because there, there were several years where it was sort of no man's land. People were living in apartments as high as the 10th floor. Uh, I'm using that term loosely too. Um, <laughs> the mezzanine was a sea of fast food wrappers from street people who were living in the building. So, and then you also had scrappers who would pull things copper, nickel, brass, anything, put it onto the marquee, and then send it down to waiting taxi cabs, and then go to you know pawnbrokers and things like that to sell everything up. So it was pretty sad. Um, people every year bring me Santa pictures, which we frame. And I brought, a, they're on a bunch of them on the, on the piano here tonight too. Because as we all know, the real Santa was on the 12th floor every year. And Hudson's was also one of the first department stores in the country to offer you a choice of Santa, too. If you were a child waiting in line, and believe me, on the weekends, that line would stretch for several floors. Each season, about 250,000 children would sit on Santa's lap. But you were in line after you went through the magic forest to see the one and only Santa. Little did you know behind those blue partitions, on a weekend, there'd be half a dozen Santas working. <laughs> and you had a choice of a Caucasian Santa, African-American Santa, or Hispanic Santa. And of course, you were greeted by Christmas Carol and the Pixies. And of course, each year was a different holiday theme that was carried out in the animated windows, on shopping bags, advertising. And of course, the themes were a lot of fun, too, which was carried out in the auditorium as well. In later years, it was more pop culture things, you know, Sesame Street, Star Wars. Now, Mr. Mills, who was president of Hudson's at the time of closure, uh, 1982, 1983, you know, the media was hounding management constantly. Because once they made the announcement, when are you going to close? Uh, when are you going to close? And, and Mr. Mills would say, close? I, I still see customers in the store. What do you mean? We're not going to close. He always said that the, the building would close with dignity, and it did. The very last Christmas, the theme was Christmas around the world. And so the auditorium featured mannequins, uh, which were of Santa, from all the different countries around the world. Um, and then there was a large Courier and Ives exhibit on 13, leading into the Riverview Room restaurant. And of course, you had the animated windows. And you still had the little carnival on the 12th floor, too, on the other side of Santa Land with rides and uh, even live small ponies and things like that. They also, um, you could buy a, uh, uh, like a, a gold charm of the downtown building for a keychain as a keepsake that Christmas as well. So, so the building went out with dignity. Um, there were a number of bricks. I know a lot of people saved the bricks from the, from the store. Of course, the red brick was most prominent in the building. 
Um, as you got to the tower level, though, some of those bricks were curved and there was like a smoked screen on them for protection because of the high winds on those upper floors. And then in the freight elevator lobbies, you had sort of orange glazed bricks. And then on 13 and 14, where you had large kitchens, you had white glazed bricks. Um, and then, of course, the building had a fair amount of marble throughout the building as well. Um, now, fuses, too. You know what a regular fuse looks like, you know. This, this is a Hudson fuse. <laughs> and there were also customized screws too. You know what a normal screw looks like. Well, of course, a Hudson screw was about like that too. Now, the store also featured one of the largest ladies' powder room areas too you've probably ever seen. Now, on the fourth floor on the Farmer Street building, there were 80 stalls. Some of those stalls were only a nickel. If you wanted a little more privacy, 25 cents. And there was also another little area adjacent so that mothers could take their children as well. I'm going to pass around a few pictures to, to stir your memory. Now, dining, as I told you, was really important to the downtown building. And I'm sure you all remember having your Maury salad, your Canadian cheese soup, Mandarin chicken salad. Now. The first full year of the Tower Edition, 1929, here's some stats that I found in a, in a Hudsonian magazine, was the, in, you know, the, uh, the company magazine. In the basement store, there was a soda and fountain luncheonette called the Breadstick, which I think I've got a poster here someplace, yeah, back there. There were 40 waitresses, 2,500 patrons a day, 15,000 patrons a week. On the mezzanine, there was a tea room which later became the buffeteria. 96 tables, 32 waitresses, 10,000 patrons a week. And of course, on the 13th floor, you had three dining rooms for a number of years. 191 tables, 100 waitresses, 5,900 patrons a week. Now, if you were an employee downtown, you remember the large employee cafeteria on the 14th floor, which seated 1,000. And 15,000 patrons dined there each week. So collectively, in any given week, just in the downtown store, almost 46,000 people dining. Now, today, remember all 23 restaurants had some sort of food service, either sit down or marketplace foods to go. Today, we're down, sadly, we're down to only five stores with food service where you can actually sit down. That'd be Somerset, Lakeside, Oakland, 12 Oaks, and Somerset. This is what the breadstick cafeteria looked like in the second basement. There was also a snack bar as well. Now, it's interesting, several years ago when Campbell Ewald Advertising moved to part of the original Hudson Warehouse, they wanted to play homage to the company. And so they opened up a dining area called the breadstick. And there are also images of what the breadstick was like, and they've also got blueprints blown up in there too. And then next to it, they opened up a little room where people could have meetings, and that's called the pine room. And of course, there used to be the pine room on the 13th floor. These are images of the ice cream and soda fountain which was on the mezzanine facing downtown library in the Farmer Street building. This was probably one of the largest ice cream parlors I've ever seen. Then you had a snack bar on the fourth floor. And then on 13, you had three formal dining rooms. Initially, the early American room, the Georgian room, and the Pine room. Now in 1959, Two of these dining rooms were merged to create the Riverview Room with the big windows, and you could look out on the river, see the boats. And then the Pine Room, in later years, became what they called the Beef Emporium, sort of a manly-type room. And when the downtown store started opening Sundays in the 1970s, um, you could go in there and watch football. 
on TVs, and then they had pool tables, which acted as salad bars. <laughs> now, a lot of people also ask about the big flag that once was on the facade of the Woodward Building. And this tradition began in 1923 for Armistice Day and continued all the way up to 1976, the year of our bicentennial. And that year, Woodward Avenue was closed off. The flag was hoisted up. The Detroit Symphony Orchestra played right in the middle of Woodward. The flag was donated to the Smithsonian. They really didn't know what to do with it because it was too huge to be able to put on display. It then went to a flag conservator out west. As the years went on, though, it continued to deteriorate. So in 1990, the company gave them permission to properly destroy the flag. Then in 2002, Target created a new flag for State Street Marshall Fields, which still flies today um, under the Macy's banner. And this is a picture of that, which it hangs in the north building on State Street. So it, it flies from about the 12th floor all the way to the top of the showcases on the main floor. The World War II plaque, also a lot of people ask about, which was at the foot of the Grand River Escalator on the main floor. This was a large eight foot by eight foot bronze plaque uh, with about 1,200 names on it dedicated to every Hudsonian who participated in the war effort for World War II. Um, after downtown closed, it went into storage and then in 1990 rededicated at Northland. Then when Northland closed, Macy's once again restored it and it's been put back in service at the Oakland Mall store right next to the elevators. These are, I'm gonna pass around different pictures of the downtown bill. This is actually a much smaller edition of a rendering. This was a painting done that prints were given to all vendors in 1947 as a thank you from management. Uh, Janet Anderson did a beautiful um, watercolor too in the 1980s. Jan Collins did a really cool photograph of the building. And then this is right before the building came down. A lot of people ask about the children's barbershop. The children's barbershop originally was on the fourth floor in the Farmer Street building, later on moved up to the 14th floor. Now this was actually two rooms. There was an outside room where you waited to get into the barbershop and it was set up like a circus tent and you could actually watch a circus via a stereopticon. And then, when you got your hair cut, you could sit on one of a dozen circus animals. And about three years ago, a friend of mine was at an estate sale in Madison Heights, emailed me a picture, and said, do you know what this is? And I said, oh my god, it's the moose from the <laughs> children's barber shop. And at the Detroit Historical Museum, we're trying to figure out, we were putting in the new gallery of culture and trying to figure out what can we add for children, you know, that families are really gonna enjoy. And so I told uh, Tracy Irwin at the museum, I said, you know, this is available, we've gotta get it. We've gotta buy it and get it restored. And so the museum approved the purchase, got it restored, and it's on the main floor at the Detroit Historical Museum now. Some of you ladies might remember powder blending. Tournoir, as well as Helena Rubinstein, had salons in the downtown building. Some of you might remember sewing. People actually used to make their own clothes. Can you imagine that? <laughs> and McCall's would have a show that came to the auditorium several times each year. Now, going way back, this is what the fabric department looked like on the third floor. I mean, it literally looks like a casbah. 
O'Connor Studios had several studios in the downtown building, on the mezzanine, and then also one in the budget store. Speaking of the budget store, some of us, of course, called it the basement store. And by the 1970s, it had been rebranded the Rainbow Store. And it literally was a store within a store. And this was one of the great things about Hudson's. If you couldn't afford to buy in the upstairs store or dine in the upstairs store, you had your own complete store on two floors. What about not quite 200,000 square feet devoted to the budget store? The first basement was pretty much fashion and shoes. The second basement was the home store and, of course, the cafeteria. Now, the basement store actually saved the company on several occasions, certainly during the war years and again during the Great Depression. And the basement store, for many years, was actually Hudson's biggest competitor. <laughs> I mean, we had Kearns, we had Crowley's, we had Federal's, we had large neighborhood branches of Sears, J.C. Penney, and Montgomery Ward. But Hudson's had such a huge command of the market that their biggest competitor was themselves with the budget store. Studio of Interior Design was another very popular department. About 5,000 homes each year took advantage of this service. And this is if you needed assistance selecting furniture, color treatments, carpeting, drapes. You know, someone would come out to your home and assist you. Um, this was Joseph L. Hudson Jr.'s, one of his favorite departments. And this used to be in all stores. In later years, it was pretty much consolidated. Uh, into several of the branch stores, and then when the company morphed into Macy's, everything was consolidated to, to Oakland. And then about five or six years ago, that department was eliminated. Um, we had a big reunion that year of a lot of folks who had worked in this department. About 250 people from around the country came back to Detroit uh, for a reunion at the Michigan Design Center in Troy. And Susan Kelly, who had been director of uh, public affairs for a number of years, uh, was our MC. And then Joseph L. Hudson Jr. had written a nice message to everyone that night. Um, we had a big historical display. And of course, we all dined on what else? <laughs> Maury's salad. <laughs> now, despite the fact that there was a branch of the Detroit Public Library right in back of the store, for a number of years, right on through the mid-1950s, the store also had a lending library on um, the mezzanine. And they would have literally hundreds of copies of very popular uh, books that came out. You got to remember, for years, I mean, you would go to Hudson's for virtually everything. You know, long before we had big box stores. You know, if you wanted appliances, you went to the 10th floor. Today we, you know, go to Best Buy. If you wanted books, you'd go to the mezzanine. For a number of years, they had the biggest book department in town. Toys, the biggest toy store in town, long before we had Toys R Us. In fact, this is a window on Woodward for Lego from the early 1950s. Who would ever imagine that Lego would make such a comeback the way it has today? With the wor if you, have you been to World of Lego at Great Lakes Crossing? And I'm going to pass around what Toyland looked like through the years. And this is a color rendering I recently got a Toyland. Now, the, a lot of community events we kind of take for granted, but a lot of them started with Hudson's. Of course, the most famous would be the Thanksgiving Day Parade. For a number of years, it was called Santa's Toy Parade. And Hudson's Big Parade started in 1924, the same year as Macy's Big Parade. I know there's been a lot of chatter on Facebook about who had the first parade. A lot of people are saying Gimbel's in Philadelphia started theirs in 1920, but it was actually only for employees only. So, so Hudson's and Macy's both, 90, 91 years now of the parade. And of course, Hudson's carried that parade by themselves financially all the way up 
to 1980. But by then it was, you know, it was well over a million dollars to produce. So they reached out to Detroit Renaissance. Other partners like Strohs and Channel 4 came on board. Later on, Art Van came on board to save the parade, which paved the way for America's Thanksgiving Day Parade Foundation, which produces the parade today. Freedom Festival fireworks were begun by Hudson's in 1959, um, initially at the Pontchartrain Hotel. And of course, the event just kept getting bigger. Um, as the company became Marshall Fields and Target, and their names were on the, on the fireworks, um, was it, I think, not quite three years ago now, Ford Motor Company has taken over the fireworks, so they're the Ford fireworks. Fash Bash was begun by Hudson's back at the Ponch, then moved to the Renaissance Center, and then became an even bigger event at the State Theater, the Fox Theater, and after parties at Comerica Park. The last true Fash Bash was in 2001 when the company was Marshall Fields. Fash Bash was a big event to raise money for the Detroit Institute of Arts, and Hudson's would bring in fashion designers from around the country, fresh fashions each fall. Um, the company, you know, paid for everything, you know, the, the designers to come to town, the fashions, the, the hotel arrangements, the venue arrangements, the food, the beverage. Again, it was getting almost cost prohibitive. There were a few little political issues towards the end. Um, Fash Bash, when Hudson's had it, it was, Everybody could participate. You had the red carpet between the Fox and the state, and tickets were anywhere from 25 bucks, you know, up to 100. So everybody could walk that red carpet and be a part of the event. The event today, uh, it still exists, different retailers involved, but it's a much more expensive event today. Um, the company, Target uh, continued Fash Bash for several other years, as did Macy's, but it was called Glamorama because Fash Bash is a registered trademark to the Art Institute. Glamorama then was also produced in Minneapolis, Chicago, San Francisco, and Los Angeles up until about two years ago when Macy's sort of ended it. It sort of ran its course. Um, trying to think, what else do I have here that I can uh, show you? Um, there's an image of employees that's kind of interesting. Uh, this is from 1889, and it looks like it's a man's world. <laughs> However, there is one female in here, and I defy you to find her. <laughs> um, several other holiday traditions uh, some of you probably r might remember the children only shop, which was on the fourth floor. This was no adults were allowed. You had to wait outside. And everything was popular priced, you know, starting at a quarter, 50 cents, 75 cents. Um, all of the counters were small for the kids. Now, the fourth floor was always the children's floor, all of their departments, even the brass drinking fountains on that floor were yay high compared to the other floors. Uh, um, the, the tree of lights, too, is either eight or nine floors of lights on the Woodward side of the building, which was always uh, a treat to see that. Um, let's pop in a couple videos to show you. Now, this first one was done in 1990. You'll see a lot of traditions, some still with us, some gone. Uh, this is when Marshall Fields became a part of the family. Uh, so Dayton Hudson acquired Marshall Fields in 1990. Over the years, the faces have changed. And the buildings. Hemlines have gone up and down. Retail, after all, is a business built on change. 
But from the very beginning, from the first time the name of J.L. Hudson went up on the old Detroit Opera House in 1881, the heart of our tradition has remained the same, serving our guests. Our tradition of guest service is how we built our reputation and warm relationships with generations of guests. At Hudson's, service is an attitude, a thread that runs through everything we do. It shapes the way we treat each other and our guests. It affects the look of our stores and the merchandise we carry. Hudson's tradition of guest service began with what was, at the time, a radical idea, clearly marking the prices on all the goods. Other merchants used a code that guests couldn't read. And rather than keep merchandise put away in boxes, we had it on display in attractive glass front fixtures where guests could see it more easily. Hudson's also offered guests these credit coins, forerunners of the charge cards we use today so they can make their purchases without having to carry large amounts of cash. We offer delivery service, so our guests wouldn't have to cart around armloads of boxes. And our basement store offered 20 departments of value-priced merchandise, soon becoming the largest store within a store in the country. We offer the fashions guests came to expect from Hudson's. We serve our guests in the way we do business and through our involvement in the community. We are connected to our guests. Their concerns are our concerns. When times are hard, we pitch in. When they're good, we celebrate together. and Marshall Fields, each with a special place in the heart of the community. We are a family of stores dedicated to fashion leadership and guest service in everything we do, in merchandising, in marketing. of technology and in the many special events we sponsor. The people of Dayton's, Hudson's, and Marshall Fields offer our guests our very best. Our common traditions are still alive today. Our department stores continue to grow and evolve, providing new opportunities for our people and new ways to serve our guests. There will be new faces and new buildings, but it all comes from the heart of Hudson's, our proud tradition of guest service. Sorry about the quality. We had to transfer it to this computer so the color isn't quite what it should be. Um, Hudson's was also one of the first stores to offer own brand. Like Hudso was one of their brands. This is actually a Hudso tooth toothbrush and some Hudso tissues, nylons. You know, at one time, there were 80 different brands of nylons offered by the store. Men's underwear, yes. <laughs> and how about Hudson's or J with the old JLH logo, even soap flakes. One of the th one of the fun things we got out of the downtown building was a glove tree, which was in the accessories department on the main floor. And of course, there's little brass hands here, and gloves would hang from that. 
And you would also get a little instructional manual on how to properly wear your gloves when you went out. <laughs> Carolyn Chase was the head of the bridal department. And of course, Hudson's had one of the very first bridal departments uh, and gift registries of any department store. Um, what else we got here? Elevators, very important part of the building. 51 passenger elevators, one of the biggest installations Otis Elevator Company ever put into a single building. 17 freight elevators. So 125 people in the elevator department at its peak, if you can imagine that. Uh, what's that? Um, and the elevator department was responsible also for escalators. Now the first escalators in the downtown building actually connected the two basements and then the Grand River end of the building escalators went up to the 10th floor and then in the late 1940s another set of escalators was added to the Gratiot Avenue end of the building and those went all the way up to the 12th floor. Okay, I think we'll put, do I press the bar to hit the next video? Okay, this one was done with the Detroit Historical Museum in Channel 7. You might recognize a few folks in this one. Hi everybody, I'm Eric Smith. Thanks for being with us. As you know, each week at this time, we present a different kind of story about our town. Today, well, a story about a very old tradition, a tradition at Christmas, a tradition about an old building that once housed a very famous department store, a story about Hudson's, a story from the heart. know nothing about whether you're rich or poor, black or white, famous or not, or not. It's just something about that building seems to just take in all people. I didn't know nothing about segregation or nothing like that. It's just, you just felt good when you saw Hudson. You just felt good. It was a magic feeling. Just walking by, it, it can, I can be times I walked by and didn't go in and you just felt drawn to it like it had a soul or something, saying, come to me, come in here. In its heyday, this building employed over 10,000 people. And also, in the, you figure in the 40s and the 50s, 100,000 people a day shopped that store. Well, I can remember as a young kid being in there, and this was in the 50s, like one of my aunts who was from the South, we were poor people from the South, we took the bus down. We didn't even have a car in the family, we took the bus down. And as a kid, you could read people's moods. And she immediately, when we got to Hudson, she changed from being real granny, like I call her, she was Aunt Granny. She got sort of like an air of sophistication about her. And I could feel that in her. So I knew Hudson was something special and that I had to be on my best behavior. My first part-time job was in 1958 uh, for Christmas holidays after I graduated. I worked in the second basement store. And it was uh, just a treat to work there and watch all the hustle and bustle. And uh, if, if you needed to boost your uh, Christmas spirits up, uh, Hudson's downtown was the place to go. When you went to the 12th floor of the toy department, and you were in line going to Santa Claus. I mean, every window you passed was an animated window. One of the big things, of course, was to go down at night and walk around the building and look in the windows, and the windows were just fairy tale. They had the most fantastic collection of dolls from all over the world, and every size and every price. The trains ran all over. Not just in one area, they had trains all over the department. 
and every conceivable kind of toy in those days. And then up at the far end, up on the stage, there he was in his red suit, Santa Claus. And of course, the only true Santa Claus uh, appeared at the 12th floor where he spent the month of December. And I believe that then, I believe it now. Sewing hats, making hats and bridal bills, that was my job, I loved it. At Christmas, they were more on different toys and different things, but then they would come down and, with their children, and then they would pick out a hat, but in a hurry, because the children didn't want to wait, you know? Well, my parents were always involved with Hudson's, my father especially, uh, in doing things, and they even asked him to film the Santa Claus Parade. Being the oldest one in the family, I would get the privilege of going with him and stand out and freeze on the marquee while we took pictures of the Santa Claus Parade. I worked at the downtown Hudson store and uh, had an opportunity to meet a young lady that worked over there in the ledgers by the name of June. And uh, in 1958, we were married. And June and I would have three children uh, the first of which was a girl, and we named her Joyce Lynn. So she was Joyce Lynn Handley, and uh, not by coincidence, her initials are JLH. The old building passed away 15 Christmases ago, but the mystique, the legend of Hudson's downtown has lingered and grown in our heart, and soon the heart will speak from the pages of a book written by one who knows the legend well. There's a life within the walls of that building. I still believe that it's still alive. And I wanted to, to live, to help the memories live on for people. Undoubtedly, Hudson's has met its demise as far as the building is concerned. But uh, that wrecking ball certainly can't take away the memories, the special memories that I had down there so many years ago. Can't take that away. The building was demolished. Uh, it was one of the largest buildings ever demolished um, uh, with explosives back uh, at store closing time in October of 1998. Mm-hmm. So, and unfortunately, nothing has really taken its place other than a four-story underground garage. Now, the pylons that rise up from the garage were part of the original Campus Marshes plan uh, for when the Compuware building was the first building as a part of that project. Uh, another uh, spec office building was planned for that site, but never happened. So, so it's been four floors of parking ever since, unfortunately. Now, I also wanted to mention the auditorium on the 12th floor. Now, when you stop and think about it, long before we had a Kobo Center or a uh, suburban show place out in Novi, the 12th floor auditorium was really our civic center because that's where you would go for dog shows, cat shows, fashion shows, um, flower shows. Um, Calico Farm was a, an event east, each Easter for kids with a petting zoo. And also, the auditorium was also an exhibition area for a number of years for new automobile introductions. Because remember, Hudson's was the only department store in the country ever to finance an automobile company, the Hudson Motor Car Company. Oh, anybody have any questions or want to share a memory? There's still a, dr a brass drinking fountain in the men's department on the main floor at Somerset, although it's kind of hidden. It used to be open, but then somebody broke the spigot, and then they put a like a plexi covering over it. However, if you want to see a brand spanking, almost looks like new polished one, um, we're putting one in the window at the Detroit shop on the third floor next to Macy's. Went in a different door, and I said, oh, and I just I couldn't believe it. Yeah, we lend things to the Detroit shop occasionally in their large window, uh, not only Hudson's but also some of the other 
retail from downtown. And every Christmas we always do sort of an homage to Hudson's. We've recreated a sliver of the Woodward shops from the seventh floor. One time we, we actually took uh, various parts of the elevator department, um, what was it, three years ago, and reactivated. We had the, the, the green for up and the red for down, and we had some of the call buttons uh, and the stool and the, the Otis brass crank for the elevator. Yeah, yeah. So, so little bits and pieces each year, we do something new there. Uh, a little bit, a little bit, but you know what? Most people don't want to hear about the demise. It's too, ne it's negative, you know? That's why I don't bring any pictures either. I mean, I've got a lot of pictures of, you know, what it was like right the year before it came down, but, you know. Well, you have to understand, it's all about economics, right? Okay, in 1969, Hudson's merged with Dayton's, Dayton's in Minneapolis. Dayton's uh, had been around uh, not quite as long as Hudson's, big downtown store, large branches, giving back to the community. The two companies had worked together. It was just a logical move for the two companies to merge in 1969 to create the Dayton Hudson Department Store Company. Um, in 1984, the staffs merged, and Minneapolis became the headquarters for the company. In 1990, Marshall Fields became a part of the family. In the decision was made to close the downtown store because of a, the sales were declining. And remember, you've always got to please the stockholders. Sales had been declining for, for a while. There were a lot of things done to bring shoppers back, brighten up areas of the store, you know, open up areas that may have been closed off years ago, special events, especially on the weekends. It just wasn't happening, though. And the Cadillac Mall development had not happened, which was supposed to be, Hudson's was going to build a brand new, you know, flagship store, obviously much smaller, about 300,000 square feet. Lord and Taylor was supposed to be a tenant. J.C. Penney was supposed to be another anchor. They never signed, the, you know, the final agreement. They could, and Hudson's always said, if we can't get two additional anchors, w there's no way that we can, you know, build a new store and be I I as it was. They were the only major retailer left for a number of years downtown because Kearns closed in 1959, Crowley's closed in 1977. So just to give you, put it into perspective, 1952, which was probably the last really good year for sales in the downtown building, uh, about $150 million in sales. I mean, you put that into today's dollars, you're really talking about a billion dollars, you know, just out of the downtown building. Um, so $150 million. 1982, last full year of downtown, that $150 million had shrunk to about 45 million. Well, you've got two million square feet to heat and air condition. It was costing over two million a year just in utilities. So, you know, they did everything they could to keep the building open, working with the city, and but it just it just wasn't happening. So the decision was made to you know to close close the store. Well. Getting back to that, in 2001, the Target, which was the mothership, um, decided that they would drop the Dayton name and go with the Hudson uh, and drop the Hudson name and go with the Marshall Field name. Which, from a brand standpoint, they felt that was the strongest brand to go with for the department store division. I mean, they're pouring a lot of money into the division in terms of merchandising and marketing. But even back then, you know, the sales were not what they should be, despite all of that. And again, it, it, you've got to please your stockholders. And meanwhile, the company, in also in 2000, had dropped the Dayton Hudson Department Store Company name, and it became Target Incorporated. 
So, 2001 rebranded as Marshall Fields. The sales still were not what they should be, so in 2004, Target sold off the department store division, Dane's Hudson's Marshall Fields, uh, to the May Company, which was based in St. Louis. May Company uh, operated department stores around the country too, May Company Cleveland, May Company Los Angeles, Kaufman's Pittsburgh. Um, that only lasted a year. And then in 2005, May Company was gobbled up by Federated Department Stores, which was Macy's and Bloomingdale's. Macy's opted to kill all of those department store nameplates and go with strictly Macy's. So most folks knew Macy's is, of course, the big New York firm with a strong presence in California. But by 2006, when they rebranded all these stores, then there were about 825 Macy's around the country. And we all know what's happened since then. I mean, it's a literal war between brick and mortar and internet today. We watched the PBS series Selfridges, and that brought back a lot of memories of the old Hudsons. Yeah, yeah Mr. Selfridge, which was on PBS for four seasons, um, great series. Mr. Selfridge actually began his career at Marshall Fields in Chicago for 20 years before he moved to London to open his own store. And that was a really unheard of thing for an American to go to Europe and tell them how to merchandise <laughs> and shop. <laughs> and if, you, um, if you're on Facebook at all too, Selfridges has posted all sorts of really cool pictures of what they look like this Christmas. Well. Great customer service, uh, not nearly as many branches either, you know, because remember the branches really started to suck the business too out of, you know, the downtown stores as well around the country. Yeah. Question was what happened to a lot of the animated displays in the downtown store? Good question. There's a flyer on the table back there. <laughs> Santa's Magic Forest which is in Taylor um, at Heritage Park, which is right near Southland Center. It's a large building in a public park. It has tons of animated figurines and stuff that were in the Hudson windows and also in the auditorium on the 12th floor. It's an all-volunteer setup each year. Each year they add more and more to it, and it's only like three bucks to go through it, and all of the money goes to Fish and Loaves, which is a downriver food pantry. So the hours that they're open between Thanksgiving and Christmas are on that flyer back there. It's really well worth the visit. It's in Taylor. It's at Party Road and North Line Road. Yep, there's a North Line exit right off of 75. Uh, okay. Anybody else over here? I wonder if uh, a lot of people didn't kind of experience the same, same thing I did when um, Hudson's and Dayton merged and then they eliminated the Hudson's name. I no longer identified with it, and I just stopped shopping there. On a, and I'm wondering if in the area a lot of people experienced the same thing and did a lost interest in Hudson's. I think to that that uh, question or statement and the other woman saying why the store closed. I mean, the city declined uh, dramatically, and also in London you have 12 million people that live there, and and it is a country, a city that is, and uh, you know people go there for, uh, and go to these stores, Harrods, all these things as as a, a sightseeing item, right? right. Yeah. So. Right. I have a story, but my this is uh, re relates to Northland. Uh, in 1954, uh, my brother took off to college, and I was just in the eighth grade. And my mother went to Hudson's, at, and it had opened in June. We lived close by, and uh, she went there just for Christmas, but stayed for 18 years. And there, <laughs> <laughs> there was such a camaraderie, and um, my f mother was not the breadwinner, so her charge plate, uh, she could not turn it over to, to my father. 
If he wanted to buy something, she had to go along with him, myself, my brother, uh, such as that. And so uh, when I needed something, I'd go to the store and I'd stand in the department and wait for her till she, you know, she would tell me the time to show up and that. And I got to know a lot of the people. And of course, you remember all the salespeople that were in one department. And um, so when I was getting married, um, these women all wanted to come to my wedding shower, and there were about 10 of them, and they were all at a, a table, and they couldn't, uh, if they uh, spoke anything about shopping or Hudson's, they had to throw a penny in the middle of the table, and at the end, end of the party, they came and gave me about 60 pennies. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> just like. You know, it's all about demographics, too. I mean, Northland, you know, that store, one of the, well, I think it was the largest branch department store ever built in this country, about 525,000 square feet. That was the size of many other cities' big downtown stores. Eastland, over 400,000 square feet. And the market areas, you know, have declined in terms of population in these areas. I mean, Detroit alone, you know, peaked at, you know, not quite two million people in the early 50s. And Today, we're about 630,000 in the city. So I have what might be a little bit of a naive question. Would th did the basement shops start the term bargain basement? Did that start with Hudson's? No, actually, Newcomb, Newcomb Endicott and Company, that early department store, Michigan's first department store, they had the first basement. So they also were revolutionary for the time, too. Um, they paid their employees to not work on Saturdays in the summertime. And they also sponsored a huge picnic for all their employees, too. So they would christen the summer season by closing, and then a parade down Woodward to the foot of Woodward, and then everybody would get on a boat and go to Belle Isle for a picnic. <laughs> Imagine being paid not to work. When we were in the elevator and this big gate would close yeah. and then the big uh, silver doors would cover that and he, and he would say, please step to the back of the car, please step to the back, and we would say that all the time. My brother, um, my brother-in-law started out in security there at Hudson's and he learned his trade there and then he was in, you know, Free Press Detroit News and then he was in his um, friend's security. H in his friend's security, he has just sold his company and he is a millionaire. He sold his own security company, he's now a millionaire. So that was a great story. I worked in um, Hudson's, it was, um, what was the other one like, um, the second name that they had, like, Marshall Fields, I worked in Himmelholz, and I loved that big, huge um, library that was behind the store. I was in there all the time. Good memories. Yeah, the elevators, I mean, it was a science to be able to work those elevators. Cause remember, they were pneumatic. And of course, you had to be very smooth to even off that floor, even off to that floor. And then before those doors, you did even up the floor, open the doors, and then of course the gate as well. And then call out each floor and what was on that floor. Thank you, this is just wonderful. And I have a question, what is your favorite relic that you were able to retrieve from the building? I something that just kind of we were very excited. Through the years, as various areas were closed off, certain floors, we ripped apart uh, drywall to expose entire elevator banks with, they still had the original store directories, like from 1948, that sort of thing. Being able to save that, being able to save some of the beautiful mahogany wood from the men's floor, from the second floor, because a lot of the writing was in gold that told you what was on each floor. So, now a gentleman um, on Cass Lake also is a, is a Hudson fanatic, and in a good way. And um, he actually has a working elevator in his home. But he has everything except the brass gate. And he also was able to get a brass drinking fountain for the kitchen. 
how were their wages compared to other department stores? Did they offer better wages? I don't know. I've talked to people who actually were paid in cash on certain days for a number of years. But I, I think they were comparable. You know, it depends on department, too, like if you were getting a commission or if the department was a lease department, you know. Employee discount was 20%, you know. And, of course, you know, uh, a store's best customer is always their own employees. I'll just share a little something. My, my mom passed away this August, but she was a buyer for Hudson's in the 50s, fashion buyer. She created her own position there, first in the fabric department and then went on to be a buyer. But she said uh, at one point she was helping with some of the windows, and she saw that someone had put a drink in someone's hand. She said, that is never going to fly at Hudson's. And so the next day when she came back, there was a rose in the hand. The <laughs> drink was gone. Does anybody remember Madeline Coe? She was director of fashion for a number of years. Uh, she's credited with making um, the little black dress fashionable, the chemise fashionable. I mean, she was written up everywhere, Women's Wear Daily, all sorts of trade magazines. Um, after she left Hudson's, she, when Renaissance Center first opened, she was in charge of getting all of the retailers there for when they, re when they opened up with all those fancy stores that they used to have there. It's somebody we haven't called on. Go ahead. Uh, Downtown Detroit Days was created by the by CBDA, Central Business District Foundation, uh, in 1954. That was the first year for it. Um, Downtown Detroit Days were every April and October. And uh, these were, it was a combination of special purchases, um, new merchandise, clearance merchandise, but it brought people down in droves. You had mystery shoppers, free bus rides. Uh, for Hudson's, these were million dollar days. And the, the, uh, um, the last real downtown Detroit days would have been October of 1982. But Hudson's went all out, not only with merchandise, but specials in the restaurants and Uh, someone's in the kitchen with Dayton's, Hudson's, and Marshall Fields, I think is one of them. And then Marshall Fields also put out a hardcover cookbook, and then also a Frango book. Um, and then there was also one that the employees contributed to. These were all under wh when it was Dayton, Hudson. Uh, Joseph L. Hudson Jr. is still with us. He has received several major awards this year. Um, he received a Governor's Award in October uh, for his years of philanthropy. Um, he also uh, received an award this summer from the Detroit Economic Club. Um, him and his wife are still on the board at Detroit Artist Market, which was a passion of both of them. The Artist Market actually started on the seventh floor at the downtown store. Um, he's also still a trustee with the Hudson Weber Foundation. Uh, the foundation was started by the Weber brothers in 1924, and to this day still gives away millions each year to children's organizations, women's organizations, and nonprofit arts organizations throughout the state. Yeah, especially at Christmas time. Would you tell us a little bit about the medical facilities they had in the building? Well, there was a store hospital on the 14th floor on the Gratiot end of the building. And uh, most of the time, there were four nurses on duty. And of course, if you as a guest uh, were ill or whatever, you know, elevator operators were instructed to take you express right up to to 14. Well, you said that at the Detroit Historical Museum there is a setup, there's a display at all times? In the Gallery of Culture we have um, a brass drinking fountain, um, we have the moose from the Children's Barber Shop, we have a few things from Northland, 
Um, what, right after Northland closed, they donated the fancy doorknobs with the JLH logo that were silver, donated those to the museum. So Eastland also, this past uh, spring, right before Eastland closed to Eastland, um, Macy's was very generous in donating some things from that particular store as well. Um, I specialized in men's dress shirts and ties. <laughs> well, you wouldn't believe how many guys come into a department and I need a dress shirt, I need a tie. Oh, what size do you take? I don't know. <laughs> well, let's measure your neck. Um, what color? I don't know. I don't know how to colorize. So, uh, you know, you spend a lot of time, whether it's for a wedding or, you know, whatever, a uh, special event, you know, that sort of thing. Well, I, I, I like merchandise, and I, I love the team that we worked with, because we, we all worked as a team. And, uh, you know, especially during the holidays, too, in the stock room, we would always have a huge spread food and beverage, and the executives always cooked a dinner for us, too, at Thanksgiving and Christmas, so up in the um, dining room. So it was just, um, well, you know, that's another thing, too. I mean, you, you know, for years you had generations of family members working in these stores as well, and today it's very difficult to get young people interested in uh, being a sales associate, you know, you know. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we don't have any millennials here tonight, do we? <laughs> um, in the men's department, did they have commission? Uh, was a commission sales there? Because I know at Northland they did. Because her husband was in the men's department. So he was I department. know at one time at Southland, the folks who worked in the suit department mm -hmm. got a got a commission. Ah, I hope he didn't tell anybody. With all the firsts that they were involved in, I'm reminded of the picture that in 1980, no, excuse me, in 18, whatever the heck it was, 1890 or whatever, um, with the one woman, and I'm wondering if there were any firsts in um, those kinds of demographics you know, when did the all-male staff shift in gender? Uh, were there any firsts in that, or was that pretty much just whatever else was going on in the country? Probably what was going on in the country, but of course later on, I th retail was really one of the first major, you know, businesses to employ l not only lots of women, obviously on the selling floor, but also in managerial positions. You know, I mean, when I worked for the company, virtually everybody I reported to in management, you know, was a female. Mm -hmm. So you bu you know, buying was al always a very popular position, too, being a buyer for all the diff different departments. Area sales managers, you know, where they would be in charge of, you know, vast areas of the store. Store managers, you know, so I would say... Oh, I would say, you know, that started probably uh, maybe late 40s, early 50s, you know. Dorothy Shaver, who w was one of the first real high-profile women in retail, she was the president of Lord & Taylor back in the 40s and the 50s, and she's the one that came up with, you know, th the rows that used to be on their uh, bags, shopping bags and stuff, so... Anybody? Let's get somebody else that we haven't had. My husband's uncle worked at Hudson's for for years. He retired from there, and what he did is he played the piano all day. He was a piano salesman, and we have a Hudson piano. And they sold. Um, he personally sold for three years. He sold a piano a day, so he okay. got a big award for that. It was really considered something to sell a piano a day. <laughs> The original Hudson's Music Store actually was on Library Street uh, in the same building. Some of you probably remember it as the
the Good Housekeeping Shop. That building was where Hudson's Music Store was. Today it's Vicente's Cuban Restaurant. <laughs> but um, the music store moved to the 13th floor of the main building. Okay, anybody else? Last call. Oh, here we go. I worked at the downtown store, and it, we made $19 a week in the Joy Department, 1% commission. And if the ladies brought it back, they docked our pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> I also sang in the Hudson Christmas Carolers oh. that went on the floor every day in December, and it was so exciting. We did concerts at the music hall mm -hmm. and one one year there were eight of us did background music for one of the big fashion shows that mrs miss co did mm -hmm. it was very exciting to work there yeah there every year there was a big fashion show called fashion scope yes. which uh <laughs> yep and he'd sit halfway back in the music hall and he'd have bracelets on his arms and he'd say that woman has her slip showing get her out of there <laughs> He was so fussy, <laughs> but it was great fun. <laughs> yeah, the store had its own carolers, of course, at Christmas time. Also, for a number of years, there was also an African-American group called the Sunshine Singers at the store. And the store also had its own radio show on WWJ called the Minute Parade for a number of years. And Santa was also on television starting in the 1950s every afternoon at 4.30 reading letters. Anything we want to promote coming up at the library this month or next month? Well, I'd have to get my list. <laughs> We've got a big sale going on right up Yes, here. absolutely. Um, well, first of all, again, I want to thank everybody and thank Michael.